Coming up next on Arizona Horizon. The drought in California is hurting agriculture there, but could it help farmers here? We'll talk about new high-tech features that will soon be commonplace in cars and see a reading program that pairs seniors with kids. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Richard Rellis in for Ted Simons. A worker at the Arizona Attorney General's office who volunteered for Tom Horn's campaign has resigned, saying that there were violations of campaign laws within the office. Sarah Beatty resigned last week and the Arizona Capital Times reports that she was concerned she might suffer as a result of the alleged campaign law violations. Horn's office has denied any wrongdoing. Former state lawmaker Stan Turley died Saturday at the age of 93 of natural causes. He served in the legislature from 1965 to 1987 and was Speaker of the House and Senate President during his tenure. Services will be held Saturday at a Mormon chapel in Mesa. The drought in California is hurting the agricultural industry there, but could it be a benefit to farmers in Arizona? Maricopa County Farm Bureau President and Dairy Farmer Jim Boyle joins me now to talk about the issue. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Well, first of all, how bad is it in California? Uh, it's quite bad. It's, a, um, it's essentially a 100-year drought in California. It's as dry as anything they've seen in, in essentially a century. Um, it's part of a bigger drought that the entire Southwest has been in for a while. Uh, it just seems to have hit California particularly hard this year. Yeah, because we're seeing the pictures of sort of those, I mean, like farmers are just abandoning. Uh... They are in some ways, and some of that's planned in the sense that in, in, in that water will move to different users depending on, depending on if you have one farmer retire some land or let, lay, it, lay it fallow for the summer and then, and then shift that water to another crop. So you'll see a reduction of, reduction of, of, of acreage and farming throughout California because of this drought. And recently they've gotten some rain, but unfortunately it, it, it didn't impact the overall picture so much because what they really rely on is the snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas, um, which just was, was almost non-existent this year. Yeah, so let's look at Arizona. Are we going to benefit? Are we gonna be hurt? Is it a mix of both? It's, it's, a, it's a mix of both. And, that, and that's because the agricultural farming systems in California and Arizona are both very large and very diverse. Um, you'll find some farmers and some industries that will do well under, in this situation and others that, that, that will suffer. Um, for example, the, um, one of the crops that California is, is, is decreasing production of is alfalfa. Um, alfalfa isn't a very high value crop compared to say wine grapes or nuts or fruits and vegetables. And so farmers are retiring their alfalfa acreage in California shifting that water to another, if they have that water, shifting it to another, another type of crop. And then they're going, the users of the alfalfa, the, the, the cattle ranchers and the dairy farmers are going to places like Arizona, Nevada, Idaho to bring alfalfa into. So in that perspective- So if you, if you have alfalfa planted in Arizona, your price just went up and you can sell it to a California yeah, we've ranch. seen we've seen prices rise throughout the winter, um, probably starting in about December and weekly prices have been increasing. Most of that hay going to California and dairy farmers and cattle ranchers in Arizona are having to compete with those prices. Yeah, well, like what kind of prices are we talking about? What was it in December, what is it now? Um, good quality first cutting alfalfa, we were talking about perhaps it being as low as $200 a ton delivered into the, the Mesa area where I primarily dairy farm. Um, right now that's gone up to about $285. Um, there's some talk of it going higher. And, um, and I imagine there's a trucking company that benefits by taking it to the you. truckers. The truckers definitely do, um, and uh, and the dairy farmers in California, they're buying this hay, are having to add, you know, pay eighty, seventy, eighty dollars in hauling on top of that. So while we're feeling bad that it's costing us two hundred eighty-five dollars a ton for alfalfa here in, in the Phoenix area, it's costing in the Central Valley of California three hundred fifty, three sixty. And I was talking to dairy farmers there that they're prepared to pay four hundred dollars. They they think that's where it'll go, um, and that hay will be coming out of other parts of the West into California. So, the, so if you're an alfalfa farmer in Arizona, this is a, a great win for you. Yeah. If you're a dairy farmer in Arizona, you're suffering because now you're competing exactly with and, with the California yeah, ranchers. Yeah, that's uh, that's 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 a that's a big issue. And and there's um, 
And then the other, some of the other farms that, that, that seem to be, that will probably benefit in certain things are fruit and vegetables. The Arizona um, fruit and vegetable market has been, has, been, has been strong. I was talking to a cantaloupe farmer on Friday um, in Maricopa, and they felt that, that they should get a very good price for their crops. Because um, of the supply, I mean, no one, few people probably saw this drought coming to this magnitude, so right. no, it's not like Arizona overplanted expecting that yeah, California and, would Yeah, and that's, that's one of the major issues as to why agriculture as a whole in Arizona probably won't be able to take advantage of it. For example, a lot of California's crops just can't be grown in Arizona. We, or if they can, they take years to, to prepare and be ready to send to market. For example, um, nut trees, um, pistachios, pecans, almonds, huge market in California. Um, and we have some of that in Arizona, but it takes, once you plant a tree, over three years until you get a crop off of it. So it doesn't do us any benefit to, 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 to try to plant you know, a, a nut tree in, in hopes of getting some profits off of, off of the California California drought. But the fruits and vegetables, they'll be in the same situation as the alfalfa farmer where they have a supply that suddenly has more Likely, demand. Likely, yes. And, um, and even though that the fruit and vegetable guys in California can often pay more than say alfalfa farmers or wheat farmers in California for water, the, the, the drought still stresses the plants out, makes them more susceptible to pests. Um, there's also been, it's, it's been surprisingly warm there, um, which has also caused a greater uh, amount of pest damage on some of these crops. And so therefore, you're, you're, there's definitely a lower supply, even if they get water. Um, so that's, uh, so there, there is an opportunity there for some of yeah, so that type the, of farming. The cantaloupe farmer in, in Maricopa you spoke to, he's going to see a little more money because the prices go up. Yes, we think so. The cantaloupe eater in Phoenix, say, is also going to see their prices go up. Do you, uh, how much stress are we going to see on the market with this? I think a lot of that's already built in. Um, we're in a period of rising commodity prices in general. Um, and that comes back to some of the basics of, of, of the world economy, is that there's billions of people in the world, they're not making any more farmland. Um, we've seen over the last few years rise in almost all agricultural commodities, and that's all mainly driven by demand. So some of that price is already, is already increasing. Um, so it's built into the system a little bit. Meaning and, that this incident, although it's a major incident to California, a major incident to, with Arizona, yeah. farmers seeing some increase for the consumer, we're not going to see a huge spike in citrus or, or vegetables? If, it, if you do see individual things, it's, it, 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 it's often related. There might be individual commodities that may have a slight impact. But in general, I think we have, there's a, there's a, just a, just a, we're in a period of rising commodity prices. And um, so I think you, everyone kind of feels that when they go to the grocery store. Um, some of that might be affected by the California drought, but it's also affected by demand in China, droughts in Mexico, all of these other things. It's too. one more stressor on an yes. already bad situation. And again, you think of that alfalfa cal uh, farmer or the alfalfa buyer in California, the rancher, that has to be built into the price of the hamburger or the steak down the road too. Are we gonna see beef prices increase substantially? Absolutely, beef prices are actually at a, at a very high level right now. Um, and that goes back to a series of events, um, mainly droughts, that started occurring eight or nine years ago. We saw a drought, large drought in Texas, followed by a drought a couple years ago in the Midwest. All large cattle growing areas such as California is this year. Farmers or ranchers have had to cut back the size of their herds um, as they didn't have the grass to feed the, the, the cattle. Um, that created a smaller pool of cattle to, to, um, to choose from which then coupled with relatively high demand as the economy's kind of improved and everybody wants a steak on their plate, you suddenly mm -hmm. have a situation where that, that, that beef cattle inventory, which right now in the country is the smallest since, since uh, 19, late 1940s, um, has suddenly uh, caused meat prices to go high. So while California is a small portion of that, it's certainly not helping the, uh, the, uh, the beef price. Are we gonna see this extend through next year? I mean, are, are farmers in Arizona thinking that this is going to continue and maybe changing what they plant or their production level? Well, we, we hope not, <laughs> despite the fact that, 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 that some, some segments of agriculture will benefit from this. But this drought isn't a California issue solely. It's also an issue for Arizona and the entire Southwest. Um, our drought this year wasn't as severe as California's was, but we are nearing a point where 
the Colorado River is potentially going to be declared an official drought. There will be an official drought on the Colorado River, which will impact agriculture first in the state of Arizona. Uh, agriculture is the first industry that takes water out of the Colorado. Um, we, have the, we have the lowest right, so that essentially that we will be cut off first before it impacts any municipality, any tribal group, any other user of Colorado water. So we fear another dry year for us or California could result in the lower Colorado River flow and then us having less water to use ourselves. Well, hope and pray for rain because now you're scaring everybody. Yes, well, <laughs> we need rain, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Jim, thanks for joining us. Thank Good you. luck uh, in the marketplace. Thanks. Cars will be changing a lot over the next few years. Collision avoidance systems, cameras, and vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication are expected to become commonplace and may create privacy issues. Other everyday car features such as keys and spare tires will be going away. Jim Preter, the car buying expert for AAA Arizona, is here to discuss the future of cars. Thanks for joining us. Oh, good to be here. Well, let's get to what is new. Uh, cameras what kind of cameras might we see it's just really it's really interesting what's happening with cameras now uh, one is a backup camera that uh, the federal government has just mandated that every vehicle has to have those by 2018 i mean but, some of those are already in place on minivans and stuff and they're uh, kind of popular uh, very very popular and it's one of those things that if you drive a vehicle and it has one of those you really can't drive the vehicle that doesn't have it because it it's so good and the technology is is fairly simple, but it's it's really very, very good. And now they've done 360 degree cameras. And so um, not only is it a backup camera, but you can sit in, in many cars, Infinity has it, other manufacturers, and look at a top down view, um, like you're hovering over the roof of the vehicle and you can see completely around the vehicle if there's something in front of you, behind you, on the side of you, a bike, maybe a child playing, um, but for now, the backup cameras are, are, um, are big. Along with that are blind spot warning systems that um, are in the mirrors that alert you um, that there's a vehicle that, that you can't see, but the camera, the warning system can see. Many of them will, f will flash um, a light in the mirror or inside the vehicle and even an audible sound and keep you from or alert you not to move over because uh, there's a, a vehicle that you can't see. What, what of that is, is the, is the backup camera the only one that's mandated? Is the rest of this for consumer? It's the only one means? mandated now. And, um, but we would expect even before then, most vehicles will have, will have, it will have the backup camera at least. So the 360 camera, again, is, is this, as I'm going down the freeway, is that going to be able to pop on or is it only when I'm parked or ready to to, to move out of a parking spot? Uh, it, it depends because being distracted uh, is also very important that they don't want you being distracted as you drive. It'd be a lot of fun um, to watch the overhead camera as I'm going down the I-10. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Honda has an interesting feature that, that's new where if you put on the, um, on, on the turn signal, the right turn signal, um, actually there's a camera in the right rear view mirror in, in the, uh, by the front door and on your um, uh, uh, screen that you have on the dash will show all the way down the side of the vehicle in the whole mm -hmm. lane. So it's not now just a flashing light, it's a, it's a camera that comes on, and as soon as you turn your directional off, the camera 
goes um, uh, back to whatever was on the screen before. Yeah, and I guess that's the, the, I guess the line they're trying to cross is making it so we're not distracted by all these gee whiz features, but are a little safer by being able to see to our right. Much safer. Spots. In, fa in fact, it's interesting, Richard. Volvo has come out and said <clears throat> they have committed that they will build a, a vehicle. They are very close to where no one will ever lose their life in an accident driving a vehicle. Wow. And they're uh, pretty close. Uh, what are the, there's, is there a camera that goes inside too? I th think I saw one that showed the face or s track the eye movement. <clears throat> that, yeah, th th there, there's, a, there's a sensor, and this is available, Mercedes has it now, other manufacturers have this now, and so it, it, will, it, will, it will detect if you're nodding off, not paying attention, and um, uh, actually... Um, we could use that for trained, the television for the viewers at home too. <laughs> <laughs> trained on the eye, and so what it will do is it will present an audible uh, sound to alert the driver, to wake the driver, and it will begin to um, apply the brakes and begin to slow the vehicle and correct it to keep it in, in, in so the lane. kind of like a really advanced rumble strip. I mean, yep. really, yeah. uh, really advanced, and that technology is, is here today and, and, and called a lane departure warning system, and I've driven vehicles that have that. You can so buy that. So that senses the lane markings, senses. and if you deviate, it alarms you and sort of tries to correct you, or does it just alarm you? Both. Oh. And in fact, I've just driven the new... Um, a, a 2015 Hyundai Genesis that's coming out, um, and and I wouldn't recommend this, but when we were <laughs> testing the new car, what it will actually do is you can let go if you let go of the steering wheel and you depart, and you and you get close to that to the uh, side line or to the center line, it will steer the vehicle back for you. You don't even have to touch the steering wheel. That's available today, and it will keep it there. It will give you 10 seconds. It will vibrate the seat. It'll vibrate the steering wheel. And, and it will correct so that the, the vehicle does not drift over that center line or off the shoulder. Wow. And it'll give you about 10 seconds of doing that and, and um, it's just enough to alert you. So it's not an autonomous vehicle that will drive itself completely. Right. That's coming probably. <clears throat> well, well, the other thing that it's seems to be now. autonomous is the, well, the, the, the vehicle communication systems. So vehicles speaking to each other? Not only vehicles speaking to each other, but but vehicles speaking to, to a cloud in the sky where there's information that is put in there. Um, and, and the technology's there and, 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 and available in some cars where if it knows ahead of time, vehicle to vehicle, that another vehicle has, is coming at a speed approaching an intersection that you're approaching and that vehicle's gonna run the red light that vehicle will communicate with your vehicle and your vehicle will begin to brake to avoid that collision. So again, really an eye in the sky. If it senses that a car is going to run a red light, it will slow down the vehicles approaching that intersection. That's exactly right. Wow. That's uh, exactly right. And that technology is already here. And vehicles, and I guess we'd have to opt into that cloud? We'd have to opt into well, that system? Well, uh, some of it, yes, because you mentioned the privacy. Uh, for instance, um, um, just uh, alerting a vehicle that another vehicle that um, there's an ice spot, icy spot in the road. Maybe you're on your way up to Flagstaff, yeah. and um, your um, uh, there's an icy spot. It'll alert you. Here's an, another yeah. example. Yeah, this is it. And um, we just looked at the other one, and so it'll alert you so that you're not gonna go through that at 65, 70 miles an okay. hour. You already know where that is. Your yeah. vehicle tells you, and it has been alerted. That's more like that. a traffic map sort of thing. There's <clears> an advisory. Nobody well, talks to each other. It's just the vehicle's alerting, and you'll get a message uh, coming up in your car. The, the other one that we just looked at was the uh, pacing that to, to keep traffic moving so there's less pollution, ease, easier traffic, is to time. The vehicle will time itself talking to each other about what speed to drive, to make all the green lights. Okay, you have control to go faster or avoid the optimal speed. Within but, the speed limit. But it's telling you if you want to time all the lights and move traffic along, right. go with this speed. And we've all had people that just go by us like crazy. And I had somewhere to be. And then only to be right at the same light that we're <laughs> at. You know what I'm talking about. And you, there seemed to be a system too, I mean a simpler one, that just lets you know when the car in front of you is slowing down or I mean that kind of yeah, avoidance. Yeah, that's collision avoidance. And um, again, um, I've driven vehicles that have that. It's available in many cars today. Um, um, actually, you, you, can, you can, for instance, drive from Phoenix to Tucson and never 
theoretically never need to touch the accelerator or the brake pedal. The vehicle will um, measure the distance in the, uh, to the vehicle in front of you and either brake or accelerate according so to... So you set it at cruise control saying I want to go 65 of course, 75 and, right. and it's allowed and it lets you know when to slow down for the diesel truck. You don't even have to slow, you, it doesn't, it, it'll do it by itself. It doesn't even, there, there's no intervention on the driver at all unless you decide you want to do that, but it will do everything including bringing that vehicle to a complete halt. And if it's a panic stop and you can't stop in time, there's pre-collision things that will happen such as uh, your, your seat belt will automatically tighten and um, the vehicle will slow, will, will attempt to uh, uh, swerve and avoid that if the lane next to you is clear. If, if it sees that you are going to hit that vehicle right. in front of you, it will, and the lane is clear to the left, it will pull you around that vehicle. It does all it can to keep us safe. Yeah. Wow, Jim, amazing stuff. Thanks yeah, for joining us with that the, list of uh, safety the, features coming up. Let's hope they keep us safe. Yeah, <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we certainly hope they will. And uh, all that inf information is available through AAA and AAA.com. We have it on there, and, and um, the AAA uh, car buying folks have that Excellent. information at hand. Thanks for joining us. You're here. more than welcome. A volunteer program that pairs children with seniors is paying off in the classroom. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Juan Magana take us to Frank Elementary in Guadalupe. Sharks have lived in the world. Think of something to do. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. We have about 608 students here at Frank in pre-K through fifth grade. About 40 of them meet with their reading buddies twice a week. Good. They're more formally known as members of AARP's Experience Corps, volunteers who are trained to help students read better. I've been involved for about five years. This is my fifth year. Nat Tinkler is kind of the ringleader. He recruited four other retirees in his neighborhood. We mark, get set, go. They're young, they're so uh, impressionable, and uh, they're a lot of fun. They just, so I get, I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. But this is more than a feel-good program, according to Principal Martha Huckabo-Smith. They do an amazing job. They read nonfiction text. They work on phonics, on vocabulary, comprehension, fluency, text endurance. They ask all those important questions related to the text that children need to know in order to comprehend and to grow academically. She says tests show students are improving their reading skills. It's a very good job. And there's another bonus. They're gaining confidence. We can see it in them. We can see the conversations they have with the tutors. We can see the children wanting to read more text. I've stopped in a few times when they're reading with the children. Um, and children will be eager to share what they have read. Many people are afraid of sharks, but... I think it's important that, especially uh, us seniors who have the time, should be able to uh, offer our assistance, whether it be in, school, in a school setting or in a business setting, why um, it's important that we give back a little bit. While giving back is a priority for Howard Shapiro, he admits it's not all fun and games. And like most teachers, he looks forward to summer break. Well, there's a lot of repetition. Okay, a couple more pages, come on. Everybody's different. We're gonna read it together, you and me at the same time. Are baby turtles? Those are baby turtles on that page. We'll get there in just a second. Let's read this. Where does the pencil disappear again? Patience is key. <laughs> Go ahead, read. 
The payoff comes from knowing they're making a difference. It gives you a sense that uh, you know their kids are going to be successful. They'll, they'll be able to accomplish something. And sometimes it comes from learning new words. As one of my little girls says, easy peasy lemon squeezy. And is the shark book easy peasy lemon squeezy? Yeah, yeah. kind of. When the school year ends, these volunteers and students will share a lifelong lesson that friendship, like reading, is fundamental. Was that fun? You did very well. I was very proud of your reading today. It was very good. Right now, Tempe is the only Arizona city using experienced Corps volunteers, but Phoenix plans to launch a program this fall with about 90 tutors in four elementary districts. That's all tonight for Arizona Horizon. See you tomorrow. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.